All good to go. All right. Rodney Knight Powell, welcome to the Tampa Bay Developer Podcast. Thank you. Appreciate I appreciate it. you doing this, man. Yeah. Um, so you are the, you were explaining your position at the Tampa Bay History Center in downtown Tampa. What exactly do you do over there? <laughs> what do I do? Uh, so uh, my official title is the director of the Touchton Map Library, uh, which is a cartographic center that we have at the History Center. We started in 2016, and it's uh, one of only about 14 of these kind of large map library cartographic centers in the whole country, and uh, the only one that's truly in the South. Uh, there's one in Texas and, and one in Washington, D.C., uh, but we have an amazing collection of Florida-based maps. Um, but because of Florida's position as this great, this gateway between the West Indies and, and mainland North America, we also have Southeastern U.S. maps and uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, Caribbean maps as well. Um, but I'm also in charge of our collections and curatorial department. So all the exhibits, all the collections, uh, that's all under me as well. That's awesome. And how did you get interested? What is your origin story? How did you become... Uh, <laughs> I guess the curator and the in yeah. charge of the topography. So um, it was, you know, almost happenstance. I was uh, a student at University of Florida, and I was I grew up here in Tampa, and so I was home um, for the summer after my junior year. I had uh, was originally a finance major. Oh wow! Uh, wasn't really my took cup, a left my turn cup of tea there a little bit, so I became a history major. Thought about going to law school, um, and so I thought. I probably should do some kind of something in the history world just to, as a job to see what that's even like. Uh, so again, came home uh, my junior summer of my junior year, after my junior year, and I looked in the Tampa Tribune, which is gone, uh, and the Friday Extra. I don't know if you remember the Friday Extra, which was this really neat little tabloid thing that came every Friday in the Tribune. Might have been before my that time. Had, yeah, so it was, it was a very, very tame version, say, of, of creative loafing in the sense it wasn't like hard news. It was mm. a lot of um, features and things. And so it was events coming up. And, and in the back, they had a listing of museums. And so I looked in the back, and there was this place I'd never heard of called the Tampa Bay History Center. Unbeknownst to me, it had just opened in a very small preview center on Harbor Island. This is 1994, so it's quite a long time ago. And so I went to see if they had a job, and they said, no, we don't have anything for you. Thanks for coming by. And so um, I went, you know, whatever, a week or so later to apply for a job at the what was then the Burdines Furniture Warehouse on Gandy. And as I was driving home, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back by that museum and see if anything's changed. Because uh, they did say, you know, we, we have something opening up in a little while. Just, you know, come back. And that's not really my personality to come mm-hmm. back and be super tenacious. Uh, certainly wasn't then. Uh, but I did. And they had just fired somebody that day. Um, so part of the deal with being in those shops at Harbor Island was they had to stay open the same hours as the shops. So uh-huh. it was 9 in the morning to 9 at night, um, but Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday from like noon to 5. And they didn't want the staff, such as they were, to work those hours. So they had college kids mm. working after hours. And so they had just fired one of those college kids. And so they hired me. And I started doing some what would be called registration work. You know, as items come in, you have to catalog them, right? right give them a number and describe them, that kind of thing. What's the coolest thing you saw? And so at that, that time, not much. We didn't have a whole lot back right. in 1994. So really, there wasn't even a history center, so <clears throat> no, to speak. It was, it was just a little unit yeah, in a shopping mall. Exactly. It was, it had, you know, we had maybe 100 artifacts in the collection. Was this a, a, a city thing or a government? Uh, or? No. So we got, and we still do, receive uh, both city and, and county funding, but it's a private not-for-profit and had has always been a private not-for-profit. Okay. And so um, one of the, I guess one of the earliest projects I did was accessioning these photographs from the Spanish-American War. And that's pretty cool because these that's are really, really old yeah. photographs of Tampa, 1898. And so hardly anything's recognizable. Uh, there's a couple views of, um, of downtown Tampa uh, from what was then just Tampa. Um, Tampa town. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that was pretty neat to see. So, but it would kind of get my feet wet. And so I, anyway, go back to Gainesville for my senior year, graduate. And then they're saying, you know, we're going to build this museum in a few years. And they offered me a job full time just to, to do research and, and just, you know, kind of gather information for them. Um, and then the, the curator left uh, six months later. So they promoted me at, you know, 22 years old to be the curator of the, of this museum, which again was very small. Um, and I thought I'll do that for a few years. I go to grad school, maybe, or maybe go to law school and do something else after we build this museum. Well, a few years turned into a few more years, and I got really more entrenched into it. And 
It wasn't until 2009 that we actually opened our permanent museum where we are now where on, it is on now. Water Street. So, so, so it took a long time to get that happening. You only were there for six months full time after graduation mm -hmm. before you became the curator. Yes, but it's a it was a, a good title for a very small space. It was we again we were very we we're, were at our very but beginning. But still, so, yeah, right? yeah, I had, I had a yeah. It was I was the was, was that opportunity <clears throat> given to you, and then you said, okay, forget law school. This is still this is so cool. I'm going to dig into this. Yeah, you know, I think part of it still was the 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 finish line was wasn't too far in the distance, and so but then as as it took more time for the project to mature, I you know kind of gained more knowledge and and kind of gained a little more stature, and so. I thought, well, I'll stick with this, and then yeah, they, I, the the dream or the oh idea of law school faded wow. away. And so, again, this was almost thirty years ago. Where was the the stuff coming in from? Like those pictures from the Spanish American War? Who would have those? Uh, families. So that one was the Leslie family. Uh, the Leslie family is a old old pioneer family. Uh, came to that came to the Florida in the eighteen thirties. Came to Tampa wow. in the eighteen forties. Um, and so really it was people, it was just the people who lived here for, you know, generations at first, again, you know, families like your family, right? who just have these things in their attic or spare bedroom. And they walk in, hey, they, I yeah. found this in grandma's closet. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, now we have, it's a much more formal system now. We have right. a collections policy that, that kind of dictates what we take and what we don't take. And really it's more about relevance to the area, not specifically items or, or, or categories of items. It's if something came in from Wisconsin or Michigan and has no relevance here, then we just don't take it. Right. But if it, if, if it has a connection to the area and it's in good condition and the other things that need to happen. How do you establish it. exactly what it is? <clears throat> like if someone That's comes in and question. says, Hey, I, I, yeah, I found this in grandma's closet. Mm -hmm. It looks like Tampa. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it? Do you do your own research <clears throat> at the history center? We, we, we do if, if need be. I mean, most of the time it's about again, provenance, which is the story or the history of the particular object. So if, if, if they have a good sense that grandma, you know, grew up here and something that, that they've always remembered her having, in this instance, then chances are it was connected here. And so, right. you know, oftentimes, again, uh, going to kind of the, the, the Latin history, you know, people will find, you know, cigar making equipment, right. you know, the chaveta and, and things like that. And we know what those are just on site. Um, and and they, they likely wouldn't have come from anywhere else. It could have come from, you know, Key West or something, but there's still True. a connection to the area. And so, um, so that's kind of an easy guess. I um, mean, you know, if someone has a spinning wheel or a typewriter or, or whatever, and, and there's no real connection, then that's that's probably a no. Do you feel like you have to say no more than yes, or what's the? Do uh, you mostly get, question. I guess, probably, air quote junk that comes in? Well, yeah, we we try not to use the word junk, but but <laughs> yeah, I know there <laughs> there course. is there are word. things that we that just don't fit our our policy. And what we try to do though, rather than just saying no and having that be the end of it, we say no. But here's a place it probably can go. And so mm. whether it is um, because, you know, someone has a, a military uniform, that's a very common thing nowadays. Of course, maybe less so now as most of the World War II veterans have passed. Now we're getting the Korean Vietnam veterans who are, who are passing from age. Um, if they served from somewhere else, again, they, they grew up in Michigan, but they ended up retiring here. Mm. We would say, okay, what town in Michigan. So what is there a museum close by where they're from? That might be a good place. So actually referring the piece, Refer particular piece exactly. to wherever that was from. Yeah. So we try and help because we just don't want something, particularly if it's important, it may not fit our mission, mm. but there's another place it could. And so better, rather than going, you know, in the garbage or, or thrift store or whatever, if we can help find a home for it, we will. Amazing. So then 2009 comes, mm -hmm. you guys build this history center as it sits today. It's a beautiful big building. There's a Columbia restaurant cafe in there, mm -hmm. multiple stories. It's really a sweet spot. And the location's incredible yeah. right on the water, right downtown the water. Tampa, yeah. right basically in water street. Yeah. So how does that whole, whole deal come about? So we originally, as, as the, the plans for the history center were evolving in the early two thousands, um, there was this plan for, a kind of quote unquote arts district um, off of Zach Street on the on the river, and of course that's where the art museum is, and that's where the Glacier Children's Museum is. The site of the Glacier was going to be the site of the History Center, ah, and so the art museum wasn't supposed to look like it does today. Or at least you know the original plan, I should say, for the art museum wasn't as it is today, but it was a much larger building, and it had this big canopy thing that. Um, extended over the park and over actually part of Ashley Drive. And it would have extended over our building. It was very expensive and it wasn't particularly well received. So you sometimes, you know, architecture 
um, it can be a very divisive topic, and in, mm-hmm. in that case, it definitely was. And we had change in administration, actually from uh, Mayor Greco to Mayor Iorio. And I remember distinctly one of the things that one of the first things she did there was a big press conference or whatever um, about really ending the art museum project as it was to transition to what it is now or what it became. And there was these little boxes on a kind of a grid of downtown, but it was a three-dimensional piece. And she had the little box that was the history center. She picked it up and she just put it to the side. And I thought, oh my gosh, after all this time, mm. now we're, we're, we're cooked. What we didn't know is that she was about to totally change the plan for the art museum, which is a city-funded museum, and, and really change the architecture, change all, everything. And she wanted us kind of out of the way, as it were. Well, prior to that, you know, in, in part of that, I should say, there was already kind of a plan afoot to, uh, for the city to acquire, um, through state funding, the property that we're on right now. And so kind of these are the behind, behind the scenes right. that we didn't really know about. Um, but she knew, and, and so that's where we ended up, which is where we are now on Water Street. Um, and it was even that was kind of a little bit of a fight because um, that was originally called St. Pete Times Forum Drive. Yeah. And we're over the Tampa Bay History Center, and so that's the Tampa Bay thing kind of throws people off. And so we thought, well, that's we got to rename the street back to Water Street, which is what it was. Um, but they said, no, because there's a Waters Avenue, and that's going to confuse the 9-11 calls and things like that. And so they said, how about Old Water Street? And so briefly, we were on Old Water Street. But when the SPP project on what became the Water Street project um, really kind of w- w- was cranking, uh, the SPP folks petitioned the city to drop the word old and just make it Water Street again. And well, and now it refers to an entire neighborhood, really, <clears throat> it, that exactly. whole area. I mean, is that what, <clears throat> do you tell that to people? Where are you located in Tampa? Well, downtown, you know, Water Street area. Yeah, no, we definitely identify yeah. uh, with that space now. Really heavy tourist area, too. You have the river walk south of you, a lot of people yeah. walking around, and then Water Street, people visiting, grabbing lunch. It's yeah. kind of worked out in a, in a great way well, to have end, your own dedicated space spot absolutely so the riverwalk wasn't complete actually it was just in its, in its beginnings when we opened of course water street as a project wasn't even on the horizon um so we really lucked out we you know we had a prime location from a real estate standpoint you know mm-hmm. being on the water is what you what you want and, and the building for those you know who don't know um even though we're on the on the water i'll say on the coast where the building itself is is built substantially and the the, the ground floor which is where uh, staff parking, volunteer parking is, and there's um, a little uh, uh, um, storage space for not for non artifacts. There's nothing on that first floor that's kind of irreplaceable, and so the the first exhibits that you see are on the uh, second floor, which is 25 feet or so above sea level, and the collection storage itself is another floor above that. So it's very sturdy, even though we're on the water, uh, it's very safe. Um, but we, you know, we totally lucked out with that location. But you see all the stuff you know, as we're looking at this image now all the things that were built around us right those two towers in channel side were there but they were empty when we moved in because again the the, the real estate crash but basically happened at the same time that we opened and it was the, in the beginning of the great recession so we were in yeah you were really surrounded you, you were an island i mean you were surrounded yeah. by literally nothing yeah and so you had you know what was then the saint pete times forum the amelie arena uh, the convention center and the aquarium, which the, was the they were the true pioneers in our neighborhood. Right, uh, but then a whole lot of nothing. Yeah, and you know with the river walk, which we definitely see a great benefit from, and then all the development of Water Street, we have seen a huge increase in our walk up traffic. What do you have those numbers? Um, off the top of my head, I don't, but I can say that um, it, it's at least doubled, if not maybe even tripled our walk up weekday traffic since when COVID since, yeah, since COVID, since COVID tripled. Yeah. And I would say, I would say maybe even a little before COVID because we saw a little bit of water street, but um, call it the last in. five years, yeah, the last five years, Wow. I would say our walk up weekday. So a little bit of a qualifier there, but walk up weekday traffic has definitely doubled, if not close to tripled. That is fantastic for you. It guys. really is. And, and again, you see the proximity, you know, Harbor Island, was again, well, you're in the middle of it all now. Yeah, yeah. You, and the only thing, um, you know, it's it's it gets a little congested um, as far yeah. as traffic goes. But right. you know, I think we're we're seeing the growing pains of of any city. Um, right. And you know, again, looking at this, you can see you know some of the barriers that, from a planning standpoint, if you could go back in time, you'd say, well, let's not do it that way. So like the Selman Expressway, it's this total wall between what is the, what has become kind of the traditional downtown and the South End, 
which was originally Fort Brooke and the garrison, and now is Water Street and all the other activities. But if you didn't have that separation uh, beginning in the 70s when the, mm-hmm. what was in the Crosstown was built, right. I really do wonder how downtown would have developed if, if we would see any difference in that in the development and not having that be such a barrier because it wasn't until the last you know six, seven years that you've really seen uh, really true growth happen on the south side mm-hmm. of the Selman. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Every American city went through that. That oh, yeah. urban renewal phase of the late 60s and 70s where oh, yeah. downtowns were just eviscerated mm-hmm. uh, well, whole to, move, to make way for highways. Well, whole and you think about you businesses. Know, I mean, everything. Yeah. I mean, urban renewal certainly was, you know, you have the, the, the highway construction, which was kind of one leg of it. But then you have the urban renewal side, which was, you know, kind of, quote unquote, slum clearance. And, right. The, de- and the demolishing of the yeah. entire neighborhood. Yeah. Central yeah. Avenue. I mean, it happened extensively yeah. here in Tampa. Oh, absolutely. Have you spoken to Greg Slater? He's the CEO of Thea. I've not. So I've not. So Thea owns the Selman Expressway. Mm-hmm. They also own Meridian Avenue. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of real estate here in town. He was actually just on the podcast oh, a couple weeks ago. And he his plan for the undercarriage of the mm-hmm. Selman Expressway is unbelievable. So you spoke about how there there's this clear kind of cut through downtown. How do we mix you know the east and the west side? Well, their plan is going to do that. They're going to oh, have parks underneath, mm-hmm. room for markets. They're going to have pickleball courts like this. Really, really, they're going to have Wi Fi under there, yeah. like everything. So they they I think they understand the damage that highways have done to mm-hmm. urban areas and so they're trying to do what they can to incorporate it in the city yeah and they already have i guess that that kind of the path that goes underneath the cross town mm-hmm. salmon and that's a part of it yeah. too the bike lanes yeah. and, all and then that there's, a, sort of there's stuff. like a dog park maybe in channel side the north end of channel side there is yeah you can see it on the right side of the map there oh, um, there it is the deputy Godfather. Cot- Memorial. Fila? Yeah, yeah, Memorial Dog Park. Yeah, and that's yeah. super popular. Oh, and yeah. Especially here in Florida, it's kind of nice to have all that shade, really. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I can use, you know, six months out of the year. Yeah, there's the dog there's park. Dog right there. You know, if you're going to have a highway blasting through your urban core, why not create spaces underneath? Yeah. Especially here in Florida. Yeah. So, um, so amazing. So 2009 comes, the History Center's built. There's quite a lag. And then today, mm-hmm. sounds like you guys are busier than you've ever been. Absolutely. Yeah, and then bus- busier in, in every every sense of the, the words. So obviously, the History Center itself, from a visitation standpoint, is really busy. You know, a lot of school tours and things like right. that, which you've always had. But mm-hmm. those seem to, to really, that was, of course, with, with COVID, um, a really, you know, a depleted part. Of, of our visitation, um, but that's come back and it's you know basically at pre-COVID levels, if not maybe a shade more. Um, but you know, you mentioned the Columbia. The Columbia, you know, for a while was one of the only places you could go to eat around there, which was right. Kind of neat, but there weren't a lot of folks who were looking to eat, so you you know you had kind of this double-edged sword. Now, and you would think there's so much competition that maybe they're not doing as well, but they're doing great too because. It's kind of that classic, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. Well, I think the reason, too, is there's a separation of space, right? <clears throat> the Columbia has the restaurant inside the History Center, air-conditioned, mm-hmm. I- indoors, maybe people visiting go inside there. But then the Columbia Cafe along the Riverwalk, yeah. people exercising, come and, you know, grab a drink or yeah. grab some some food and, and people exploring the area. Like, it's, it's so much more than the History Center's restaurant. Yes. You know, it really feels like this organic restaurant outdoor restaurant space. Tampa really doesn't have a lot of outdoor restaurant space on the Riverwalk. I mean, you've Marriott has a restaurant, right? Mm-hmm. Anchor and Brian, I think yep. it's called. Yep. You know, but the Columbia Cafe certainly was a pioneer in that sense. Yeah, you know, when when and when we opened and when they opened in um in 09, there there was hardly any place. You had Ricks in the River. Right. Um and 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 maybe Which is a way handful, up the river. way up the river. Yeah. And so maybe a, a small number of places. I guess the Marriott at that time still had whatever their restaurant was at the time. But um, but no, for as much coastline as we have, there's just not a lot of places to eat on the water. So it definitely filled a, a void that was needed. There we go. There's and they've done views. a great job too, kind of creating that classic Columbia look on the interior with the bar, and oh, the yeah. Spanish tile, and all of that. Yeah, and, and, and how appropriate that they would be the ones to open the restaurant, right? They have so much history. Well, they do, and so you know, again, for for those who who've um, old enough and been around long enough do you remember the the shops at harbor island when we were there but there was also a columbia that was there oh, and I don't so think I knew that. yeah and so uh and caesar uh gonsmart was, was still alive and and he told told richard 
you know, as this place grows, the place place being history center, uh, we really would want to make sure that Columbia stays a, a part of it. And so, you know, they would do catering for us at that time, um, not exclusively, but you know, since they were right down the down the hall, basically, uh, we work with them. And so, when it came time for us to look at the food service provider, he you know, approached Richard, and right. he remembered what his dad said, and and you oh, know, amazing. it really worked out very well because uh, you know, again, we could have you know, no offense to the to the many uh, franchises that are out there, we could have a, a national brand there right. that is recognizable, but it just doesn't have that same feel. You know, now you know we can really continue the history experience from the galleries all the way into the food service and people right. can learn another thing and actually literally taste the history of yeah, our city. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. We go there all the time. So the actual, let's dig into the history of Tampa. I've been yeah. super excited to talk to you about this. Um, and, and I guess we'll just start from the very beginning, right? The first, there was obviously the native Americans that mm -hmm. had tribes in the area. Mm -hmm. Toko Baga, I yep. believe. Toko Baga. Toko Baga tribe. Mm -hmm. And then weren't there other tribes here locally, smaller tribes too? So, you know, it, it's always difficult, and we do this. And, and we're it's talking still thousands of years yeah, ago so, too. So. so, you know, again, let's the the, the 10 second history lesson um, of, of this story. People began coming to what we know as Florida, you know, 12,000, 15,000 years ago. Um, but the crazy thing is Florida was literally about 90 miles wider at that time. So Tampa and the Tampa Bay area weren't on the coast of the Gulf. We were, uh, you know, anywhere between 70 and 90 miles from the coast. So that extra land, as it were, extended into the Gulf of Mexico. Wow. And so anybody who's, you know, done any kind of boating um, knows how shallow, of course, Hillsborough Bay is. Right. In parts of Tampa Bay. But even the Gulf itself is really shallow. And, you know, until you get 60 miles, 70 miles, you know, kind of away um, from the from our coastline. And that was dry land 12,000 years ago, even 10,000 years ago. So as these native groups were coming in, we don't exactly know. Of course, they didn't have, we didn't apply names to them. They probably applied names to themselves, but we don't know what that is. But by the time of the Europeans arriving in the 1500s, there was a very well-established native presence here on what we now know as Tampa Bay um, that had been here for thousands of years. Um, and so the Tokabaga were probably centered uh, in Safety Harbor. So, you know, the, the Philippi Park right. and the large mound, that was probably kind of the main um, village, for lack of a better term, for the Tokabaga. And they were the dominant group. Mm. Uh, but there are other groups that the Europeans named. Now, whether they were related or even the same or not, who knows. But there right. were the Makoso and the Usita uh, and a few others that were uh, along Tampa Bay. So the Makoso are identified really as living in what is now downtown Tampa. And there was actually a mound, um, a burial mound where um, Emily Arena is today. So that picture on the top, <clears throat> kind of left, uh, Tokobaga Temple Mound, Pinellas yes. County right there, yep. Tyler, uh, two, two over. So, so that was their capital, so to speak, or at least sure, what like we the main, think could the, have been. The main village. Yes. Is that a lot of history? Like, hey, we think this, yes. or you know, there's indicators that point towards this. Yeah, so the one of the hardest things for people to kind of wrap their head around, oh, there's actually a picture from the History Center, um, I think, or something similar from the History Center, the, uh, the map with the different people on it. Oh, yeah, cool. Um, and so you have to be comfortable. Tribes. You have to be comfortable saying you don't know. You got know, to be comfortable saying we think. And information um, is, is always changing, so, right? Well, particularly this, you know, so much of this is, is based on archaeology. And, yeah. Um, well, you're also and, talking and about some, a lot of time, too. There's a lot of time. Again, yeah. you're talking thousands of years to some degree. Um, but that's why, you know, when you get to the 500-year kind of record, what's called recorded history, well, when the Europeans arrived, you know, they, in you know, lack of a better term, they took notes, and they had a written language. Uh, most of these pre-Columbian, you know, pre-contact Native tribes didn't have a written language. They obviously had a verbal language. And so their stories are passed down um, by oral history. And there are no uh, first, or very few firsthand documents from those people. And so it's it's all about, you know, the archaeology right. that you can come up with and whatever conversations were would have been had, you know, obviously very rudimentary between the early Europeans and with them. And obviously there was a huge language barrier because they didn't understand each other. Right. And the amount of time from... European settlement to their demise was so quick compared to their entire thousands exactly. of years of history. Yeah, you've got a 10,000, 12,000 year uh, presence. And then within 200 years, uh, you know, you have a 80% attrition. Yeah, right. And all of that history lost so quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the Toko Baga, that is the tribe that we attribute all the good luck Tampa Bay has oh, with hurricanes, don't say right? That. that is. <laughs> but it's them. It is, isn't that the tribe that everyone, I guess, refers well, to? Well, yes, it is them that people, although I have heard, I gave a talk over in Clearwater and somebody said, um, so we heard that there was a, a big seminal gathering of, um, you know, they, they person said medicine men, and they blessed the area because there are so many uh, burials in the area. <clears throat> Excuse me. And all of that is completely nonsense. Not that those people, <laughs> you know, obviously the, the culture is a very important culture, but for us to attribute anything like that other than, again, it's been sheer luck. And right. know, how about this? We've actually had hurricanes hit here. It's just been a while. So 1848, there was a hurricane that devastated the little village of Tampa. 1921, that was the really big bad. Right. Yeah, actually the 48 one was worse, but there was less stuff here. And so it didn't, it didn't have the impact because mm. you had a, a much smaller presence. The 1921 storm was really a category one, maybe low category two. Um, where the the 1848 was probably, from what they've been able to ascertain, maybe a Category 3. Um, but again, there was hardly anything here. There was the Well, fort. look at, uh, was it Ivan or Ian? Uh, they were all eyes that one year a few years ago. The mm-hmm. one that slammed Fort Myers, yeah. that one was about to hit us. That yeah. would have been like the 1921 hurricane. Yeah. That would have been or a worse. horrible storm or yeah. worse. Yeah, and so there was the the ones in 04. There was the, like Charlie. And right. The, they all did the same thing. As, again, I can't explain. I'm not a meteorologist. Right. Um, but the, we are not, I guess, the, <laughs> thing, the, the message of, if no one takes anything else away from this for today but this, is uh, if they say evacuate, evacuate. Uh, don't yeah, think yeah. that there's some some. The Toko bag thing. has got us. We're good. We're going to yeah, stay. Exactly. Yeah, that's, don't, that's, that's, don't think that way. Yeah, that, that's the thing that I guess I worry about is that there's somebody out there who will think, well, you know, there is this this blessing that we have over the area, so we're, we're going to be fine. I'm not going to leave. No, leave. If they say go, go. Yeah, there we go. There's there's a... Um, that's not all of them, probably, but that's a it's a lot. So there's yeah, the twenty one storm looks like the one that it made landfall in Tarpon Springs. Well, there's eight major hurricanes in seven years. You can click that, Tyler. Ian was the one I was talking yeah. about. I mean that, or was it Irma? But They're you're very right. similar. But you're, there were a lot of ice storms, and then Ivan's not even on there. You're so right too about pure luck because if you look at a map like that. Look how really evenly dispersed mm-hmm. these major hurricanes are. There's no telling where they're going to hit. We've just yeah. gotten lucky. We've been lucky. And so our day will come. Our, and we, unfortunately, that's true. Yeah. We just got to make sure we're prepared. And yeah. so, again, like the History Center is built in such a way that it can withstand a very oh, strong Well, storm. I wanted to touch on that, too. There's yeah. so many important documents and mm-hmm. physical things that the History Center has. You mentioned something earlier about how it's actually built up mm-hmm. the less important Items you have are on the bottom. Well, we have like hardly that. anything in the in the ground floor, and right. so the first floor because is of this reason. Yes, though. absolutely. No, yeah. we were very aware that we are in a great location from a attraction standpoint and um, you know real estate standpoint, but we are very vulnerable, and so we needed to make sure the building could right. accommodate you know that worst case scenario. And yeah. so, so you know, again, nothing's hurricane proof, but it's pretty darn hurricane resistant. Okay, so <clears throat> Native Americans. We, we believe it was the Toko Baga tribe. And then a lot of the information we have is based on Spanish settlers. Mm-hmm. And then probably later, too, in the Spanish-American War and the going into the 1800s, what those soldiers would have written down as they were stationed in Tampa at Fort Brooke. Well, so by then... Or am I know, jumping maybe yeah, too you, far ahead? Exactly, yeah. So you you have this original group of people who had been here or their descendants, in, or excuse me, their ancestors had been here for literally thousands of years. And then you've got this 200-year attrition uh, through disease and warfare and slave raiding, things like that, um, that diminished the native population. Um, but for Florida, we have another, not really a separate group, but a group that, that has you know connections historically to Florida, but then also connections to like Georgia and Alabama, um, the Creek tribes that were there, you know, named by the English, the Creeks, who came in to Florida in the 1700s. And so you have, this became the Seminoles, the Seminoles mm. and the Miccosukees. And that's the group that we, of course, we have Seminoles and Miccosukees still here in Florida today. And it is their presence in Florida that really prompted the creation of things like Fort Brooke and, and really a series of, of, of Indian wars that happened in Florida before they happened out West. You know, we think about cowboys and Indians, quote unquote, and that's all stuff out in the West and Custer and, and, and all those things. That all is after the Civil War. Well, we had Indian Wars here in Florida before that. And when you look at them from a standpoint of cost and from lives lost, 
they were like the probably the, the the largest war against the native population was here in Florida. There's Fort Brooke uh, from the 1830s. That makes sense though, right? Because the reason there was so much, so many deaths from Native Americans to the people that were settling, right, from settlers, was because there was nothing out west. There's no infrastructure. So as people moved out there. They were obviously attacked by the native population. So the same thing was happening here just a lot earlier. Well, yeah, and, and you know, it was definitely a, 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 you know, attacks and things on both sides. It wasn't oh, just native course. people who were, of course. see somebody who's not like them and they immediately kill them. No, you know, it was no, but I mean, obviously, and, yeah, like settlers moving to an area that are European, mm -hmm. the Native Americans are going to go, hey, you, you're taking our land. You yeah. know, we got a problem with that. Yeah. So that, that happened here. Yeah, you had these conflicts between these different groups. And we're talking maybe early 1800s at this point. Yeah. So Florida becomes a U.S. territory in 1821. Mm -hmm. So you think about, you know, Florida history, um, you know, we are an, an old place, but we have the perception of a very new state. And so we had been and, you know, occupied and, and basically owned by other countries, you know, well after the establishment of our own country, you know, we were Spanish from 1513, basically through 1821, except for a little window when we were English. Uh, the English actually owned Florida during the American Revolution, believe it or not. We could have, we were, in fact, the 14th and 15th colonies of what became the United States. We just didn't rebel like the other 13 did. So mm -hmm. no one really talks about the British period of Florida and how we were also a colony just before the, the revolution uh, because, again, we, we stayed loyal. Um, and so we have this, this history that is really old and, and predates the creation of, of the country, but we didn't participate in the sense in the creation of the country. So, mm. so the history of our, our history kind of gets downplayed a bit. But when we finally became an American territory in 1821, you had these native people living here and you had these kind of border incursions prior to that, but people lived in Georgia and Alabama trying to push into Florida, which was in Spanish before we became a territory and pushing kind of against the Seminoles. And then the Seminoles kind of pushed back a little bit because mm. you had just, you know, this conflict. So when, when we became a territory, there was now, you know, this open space, like, okay, now is it the American government? What do we do with it? Well, we want to settle it with, with white settlers. And if we can bring enslaved blacks into it and they can work the land, then all the better. Well, that was a huge conflict with the, the Seminoles. And mm -hmm. so that's what really sparked the, um, the, the, the idea of removal. And that's, again, what helped, you know, create Fort Brooke. You know, Fort Brooke was established as a military fort attached to a, a treaty with the Seminoles. Um, but it really was a place, ultimately, where the Seminoles were removed from. And so they came either by um, surrendering or being captured, brought into to Fort Brook, which is now downtown Tampa, and then shipped out to... Uh, New Orleans, and then they would walk to the Oklahoma Territory you know, as part of the Trail of Tears. Oh my gosh! So, so we were part of that um, that Trail of Tears that that uh, the other you know tribes in the East participated in. So the Seminoles would show up to Fort Brooke and essentially be processed. Yeah, you know who are you? What's your tribe? Exactly. And, wow, they would, and even have family members who, if they were black, um, separated from them, and so they actually we actually have a, a ledger. Uh, at the History Center that um, we have kind of in partnership with the county um, that is a court document saying, like, a Seminole had to prove that they owned their wife, in this case, or, or, or a husband, um, who was black, and say that they weren't my spouse, they were my slave. So that way they'd be allowed to take them with them to the Indian Territory. If they couldn't prove ownership, they'd be separated, and the black person would be re-enslaved. And so you have this separation of families going on as part of this processing. Is this information only known once you receive a document and go through it? Like how else would, would that story be told, right? Well, through oral history. Through and oral so, history. you know, in the 1930s, uh, during the, the Depression, the federal government sponsored a huge oral history project. And so there are stories like that um, from people who um, either, you know, were the children of those people or grandchildren, but they'd heard those stories passed down through oral history. And so wow. there was a already indication that that was going on, but then you have these documents. Right, to that match that up. up. Wow, yeah. interesting. Has there been anything in your tenure that has changed the narrative in history or or something that has surprised you or or the entire history, you know, well, a lot of people? It, yeah, that's the thing is, you know, I think, you know, as historians, uh, we're, we're a kind of a cynical bunch. And so it's kind of a little hard to surprise us because we just kind of assume that, you know, people, human nature is, is such that 
you know, isn't it's, it's hardly surprising. But there are some really interesting details and things that come about that when you see proof of it through a document, right? That is really a great thing. So you hear an oral history, and you always have to take oral history with a grain of salt. Of course, um, because it's you know it's someone's memory or somebody's retelling of somebody else's memory, but when you can corroborate that with a historic document or a map or something, then that really is a is, yeah. is a neat kind of light bulb moment. So it would take something very significant to change the needle on how history has already been written down. Well, well, so you know some of it, you know, again, historians are people, and so you. As objective as you try to be, there's always your own lived experience that will, in a sense, color how you're interpreting something. Yeah. And so, so you know, people think about revisionist history and reinterpreting history as, as a negative thing, and it doesn't necessarily have to be. You know, oftentimes you want to be able to look at information through a different perspective. You know, as we... Um, you know, as we grow as people, you know, we can change our opinion about stuff, or at least the kind of the cultural opinion about things as we learn good, good and bad, you know, but the other thing is you, you have to be cautious to not then apply modern, you know, mores and modern morals and things on the past. Yeah, that's a that's a tough, it's a tough line to, to, yeah. to, to go. And this country has been dealing with that in the last few years, pretty <clears throat> extremely. It, yeah, and it, we always have, though, you know, right. it's always been that way. But I think, as I think things are coming a little more extreme in general, you know, as, as information and technology comes about and as the, the information moves so much more quickly, right. it's harder to process because there's also so much more information. Um, you know, one of the biggest things um, that, you know, not so much an event that was surprising, but just the idea of, of the massive number of documents that are being digitized. And so it's, it's, Maybe not that that we're we're learning anything new in the big picture, but we're able to see so many more details because there's so much more available to to researchers. And an individual can get <clears throat> the proof they're looking for very easily too, right? Yeah. So something you hear that might be hearsay or those passed down oral traditions. Well, now it's easy enough to go on Google, and mm -hmm. thanks to what you guys are doing at the History Center, and we can talk about this, digitizing yeah. these documents, yeah. you can pull up the document on the computer for yourself. Yeah, and so a quick example is um, for my, my um, master's thesis, I wrote a, a basically a biography of, of David P. Davis, the creator of Davis Islands. And from the time that I did that in the late 90s um, and early 2000s to when I actually I wrote a book about Davis Islands and Davis uh, in 2012 was published in 2013 that 10-year 11-year window um, there was so many more documents that were digitized I was able to find out facets of his early life that I could never have known mm. before because I just even know where to look he actually was in New York for two years in the 19 teens before he ended up back in Jacksonville I had no idea and there was never I would never have looked for him there but I was able to uh, actually using ancestry.com you know you can use it for more than just your own family um, I was able to kind of create a path of, of his life through the documents that they had that I would have, can, would never have dreamed. And, and he was his own PR guy for a while in the 20s, and he made up all these stories about what, what he was doing, trying to make himself out to be, you know, kind of an important big I, person or a dare, daredevil. I would imagine all of the, um, you know, the big business guys and these moguls back then were doing that, right? Oh, I mean, totally. 1910s well, and 20s, you know. Well, particularly the 20s was such a huge, you know, it's what we're kind of going through now in the 2020s, but the, right. the land boom, you know, every, everybody was larger than life, but he really was. Um, but he put a lot of PR about himself that wasn't exactly right or true. So I was able he to He had to a lot of that. lots to sell on Davis <clears throat> He Island. did. Well, he sold all the lots. He just didn't keep getting the uh, the mortgage payments. That was his downfall. Right. That and then all that kind of went away in what the 19 late 1920s crash, right? Yeah. The real estate. Real estate crash and and really late 26. Mm. And then 27 was when things really fell apart. He was already dead by 27. We'll dig into that a little bit, but let's go back. So so we're talking early 1800s. Uh there's obviously conflicts between the settlers and the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Fort Brooke is established. Mm -hmm. It's a processing point for Native Americans to then be shipped overseas to New Orleans, starting the Trail of Tears, which I didn't know. that I didn't know that we were involved in that. It's yeah. actually kind of fascinating, yeah. really. Um, and so how does it go from basically a small military outpost to at least the start of Cigar City? Because it sounds like we're talking less than 100 years before the first cigar factory and Fort Brooke uh, original purpose. Yeah. So Fort Brook started in 1824. Um, and by the late 1820s, there were a few civilians who were settling uh, around the periphery of the fort. 
And so by the 1830s, you had this little town that was called Tampa that had grown on the north end of the fort. And it was really that nascent uh, community that was the only city or town in what they called South Florida. So, you know, we have University of South Florida. It's kind of an odd name um, because it's in Central Florida. Um, But even as in the 1940s and 50s, uh, we were kind of thought of as South Florida, oddly enough. But in the 1800s, we definitely were thought that because there was nothing from a white standpoint, um, or even almost south of Ocala, uh, which was also a military fort called Fort King. Um, there were just these outposts. And then, of course, Key West. Key West is always the outlier. Mm. Um, but other than Key West, Tampa was literally the only city um, south of, I think, probably Brooksville or Ocala. Miami's uh, in the nothing. 1850s. I mean... Miami's Fort Dallas, and it's a very small military fort. Uh, fort Lauderdale is literally Fort Lauderdale. Same with Fort Myers. Mm. Um, and there you know, may be these little communities uh, of, of civilians, but for the most part, Tampa is it until the 1880s, 1890s, when the railroads finally make it make it through. And so the railroad is what created South Florida. Henry um, Plant, and, and Henry, Henry Flagler. Flagler. Exactly. Yeah. So the railroads come about, and it sounds like, what, the mid-1800s or so? 1880s. 1880s. So to get another little fact for you, um, you could be on a train. You could take a train from New York to San Francisco beginning in 1869. You couldn't be on a train from Tampa to New York or New York to Tampa until 1884. Wow. So you've got, uh, what is that, 15 years when you could go transcontinental on a train, but you couldn't take a train to Tampa. It makes sense why Flagler and Plant wanted to move down here because like from a real estate developer or a business perspective, this is so much untapped land and it's so much closer than California. Yeah. And yeah. And we've always been this kind of pioneer or, or frontier space. Um, but they, they're the ones who really closed that frontier because they saw again, particularly Flagler because plant came through the interior for the most part to get to the coast. But Flagler just went straight down the East coast Mm -hmm. and, you know, built several hotels all along the way through St. Augustine. Yep. And then the breakers. Yep. Exactly. You know, you got uh, Palm beach and then all the way down to Miami. And then of course, eventually, in 1912 to Key West. But, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, that's, they saw the potential from a vacation and tourism standpoint, um, for Florida uh, and just, they had the money too. It, everything kind of lined up, you know, you've got this, the, the gilded age where you've got these people who are already, you know, making millions of dollars. I mean, Flagler was uh, immensely wealthy, uh, from standard oil and, and he's, he spent a lot of his money, but he, he, you know, he made, would be you'd be a billionaire, you know, in today's terms. So the Florida, you know, the, the Florida vacation started in the late 1800s and really mm-hmm. never let up because we've yeah. always had that yeah. since then. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and even before that, you know, there's, you know, people would take river cruises in the St. Johns and Lackawaha, and they would go to you know Green Cove Springs because it was supposed to be kind of a rejuvenating spring, but it was really yeah the 1880s, 1890s with the railroads and then the hotels, right? That um, that allowed uh, people to really come to Florida. And it was a, a kind of a middle, but also up, upper class crowd doing so. And they right. were here for a month or two at a time. Well, it makes sense though. I mean, back then, right? No air conditioning, oh, mosquitoes yeah. everywhere. Yeah, it's all winter visitors. Right, all winter visitors. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about the Civil War real quick because Fort Brook was established pre-Civil War like mm-hmm. we talked about, mm-hmm. but didn't Fort Brook play a role in the Civil War? Wasn't there a little skirmish of some sort? Yeah, so saying played a role in the Civil War, it was, <laughs> well, things occurred during right. the Civil War here, <laughs> but um, didn't really affect the outcome. The um, Battle yeah, of Tampa. Yeah, exactly. So there were a couple different times when uh, when Tampa was attacked by the, so, so very early in, in the secession of, of Florida from the Union at, at, uh, in January, of 61, uh, the local militia took over the fort. And by that time, the fort, you know, we, the, the, the conflicts or the, the wars uh, with the Seminoles had ended by then. And so the federal government didn't really have a large presence at Fort Brooke. And so um, the local militia in January, February of 61 was able to basically take over the fort. And, uh, and so Tampa was kind of a Confederate stronghold um, at, that, uh, at that time. Um, and there was blockade running that, uh, that went out of, of Tampa, you know, using the Hillsborough River uh, to, to ship things in and out uh, to try and break that Union blockade. Um, and then in 1863, we were attacked by uh, Navy ships. And then in 1864, 
actually captured um, by the by the Union Army, uh, but not occupied for very long. Occupied for a week or two, um, and then they left because there really wasn't anything here. Yeah, they're like, what was all the yeah, fighting for? This yeah, is right? nothing. And so they, you know, they took away the cannons. Uh, they did emancipate some of the enslaved people who were here. Um, those who couldn't leave. Uh, would likely have been re-enslaved because even though the, the Emancipation Proclamation was in effect, in effect, um, if if there was no union presence, there was no union enforcement of it. Right. And so there, so there, there definitely were some who would have been emancipated and would have probably gone to Key West. Key West, uh, would never was never um, held by any Confederate forces, and so that was a, a place where a lot of folks who were either had been enslaved or were uh, uh, unionists went to. Um, but uh, but then after the it wasn't until after the war that that Tampa was kind of reoccupied, right? Um, and the fort itself and there's actually a great one of the last pictures his final battle of Fort Brooke that's actually a photograph though from the 1880s. No way! Um, oh my gosh! And so that's yeah that's Fort wow. Brooke, um, right before it was decommissioned. Uh, this Look at is that. Probably 1882. Look at the big grand oaks with the Spanish moss. So people would talk about those oak trees all the time. There actually was there there were more oaks that were there. Uh, in the 1830s, but there was a commander of the fort who had them all cut down, so they couldn't, you know, be snuck up upon. Right. They wanted a clear open field, but you know, this that photo was taken 50 years later, so um, a lot of the oaks came back, and there it was. By that time, there were the officers' quarters, um, which were roughly kind of at Platt Street and and Franklin, and um, it became called the Carew House, and and then there are a few other uh, buildings. Interestingly. When the fort was decommissioned, there was a chance that the entire fort property, so those who can picture downtown Tampa, from Whiting Street to the south to the to the water, um, so you know, acres and acres of land. Oh yeah, could have been a city park. The city actually wanted to acquire it, and they they were going to petition the federal government to to transfer the fort from the the War Department and just basically give it to Pillsbury County or give it to the city of Tampa. But there was this guy named Edmund Carew who knew somebody uh, in Washington, and instead the land was transferred to the uh, Department of the Interior where it could be homesteaded, and he homesteaded a big chunk of it, um, but as did three African-American families. Mm. And so so they all had their homesteads uh, verified, and so they all owned different pieces of Fort Brook. So you can see the green, let me actually go back, um, it's probably better, the green outline right. is the outline of Fort Brook, and so the kind of the rectangular bit is where the fort itself was. Now the line that goes up and over, that was this kind of uh, corridor that went to what was called Government Spring. And so it's a um, likely underneath the uh, Swoper Dante law firm where the where the brewery was. Um, uh, there's there's some, you know, some maps that show it there and there's actually a spring there, so we you know, we'd think that that would be it. Uh, but there are other maps that show it a little bit to the south and so there may have been multiple springs up there. Uh, but there definitely is a spring there at that in that building, and so it very well may be the official government spring. But anyway, that was all the fort, and so the Carew was able to get basically the western half of that rectangle, and then the other bits, the mm-hmm. eastern half of the rectangle, and then that corridor up, were homesteaded by by three African American families, and part of that area became known as the Garrison, which was a black neighborhood, um, which was contemporary with the Scrub, which was kind of the main black neighborhood. Um, that followed the Civil War. Well, <clears throat> the Civil War is very well documented, right? I oh, mean, yeah. We're not talking that long ago in terms oh, of history. Yeah. So. And there's newspaper accounts. There's all kinds. Right. So, yeah, we know. Well, even photos like the one. Oh, well, so there, that actually was pre Civil yeah, War. Yeah, that was. Um, yeah, so there's these illustrations that show the fort. Um, there are no photos. I think the earliest photograph of Tampa, the actual true photograph, was in the late 1870s, mm. and it shows the mouth of the river. And this so, survey here is 1852, so maybe 10, 12 years before yeah, so, the Civil so, War. Exactly. Um, well, nine years before the start of the war. Right. Uh, but yeah, so this is the government survey that this was, you know, one of the best ways, the only way to sell land was to have these government surveyors come out and, and break the uh, land up into township range and sections. And then once you have that, you can then homestead, and you get a quarter section, which is 160 acres of land. And then from there, somebody can subdivide, subdivide it further. But before you have this township range and section, you really don't know what you're selling. And so that was one of the biggest things in Florida when we became a territory up through early statehood was creating. So you see like the numbers like 12, 13, uh, or yeah. Right. Uh, 17. Um, those are um, the section numbers. Mm. And so each one is a quarter 
and then it's broken further in the quarter section. So you see, like, just in Tampa Heights, you see the number 13, then the 160 kind of mm-hmm. up. That's a quarter section. So somebody received that as a, as a grant of land. The other ones are, are smaller sections that people received. Now, you said black families owned a good portion of the blue area that's outlined. The right? green area. The green area. The green area. So the blue area was what the federal government reserved for Fort Brook. But the green area is, is really the kind of the practical extent of the fort. Wow. And so that's so so you had that um, those were, were black owned that kind of eastern half or eastern portion that includes the corridor that was settled at homestead and settled by by three black families. Then the red outline is the original outline of Tampa. If I'm remembering correctly, there was a sort of graveyard for the black community where Water Street is, I think. Well, so that's so Graveyard, yes, but not for the black community. Okay. And so uh, as Water Street was being developed, there was um, a kind of discovery and, and, and then the kind of legal appropriate removal of remains. That was a Fort Brook cemetery. Oh, really? So there were, when they, when when the Fort Brook garage and One City Center, which is now, I forget the, the, the Hyatt, I think, um, and the office tower that's there, when those were built in 1980, um, they uh, found a cemetery there by accident. Um, and that was the, you know, the first Fort Brook Cemetery that came about. As Water Street was being developed, we actually notified SPP that when they acquired that piece of land that they did for that, they said, oh, congratulations, you now own a cemetery. So the History Center knew about yeah, the cemetery. Yeah, we knew about it. Yeah. From maps you from, received? Yeah, from maps that we have, from the, um, mainly from the, um, the uh, uh, Piper family, Mm. Um, Harry and Jackie Piper were the archaeologists who did the work in 1980, and they found a lot of maps. And we actually have some in the collection that we that we also have that the archaeologists who did the Water Street, what they call the um, the Estuary Cemetery, they used with kind of modern georectifying and things. Actually, if you go to the History Center's um, uh, website, you can find. I'll show you um, really the map of Tampa that is that even um, um, land purchases are based on today. How I'll did show SBP you where that take is. that? They said what? They were fine. Yeah, they they understood that they were buying historic property. Right. They have always been really um, embracing of our history, uh, more so than most any developers that I've seen come about, and certainly for the scale. If you look up, if you do search for um, for Jackson, um, I'll tell you which map it is. Um, the uh, they they have been really. Well, that's expressed in the development. Okay, so, when, you, when you walk in Water Street and yeah. you see all the mature trees, the beautiful sidewalks, the way they've built it, you can tell they care. They, they do. They really do. They really do. So third row in the middle, the, the tall, skinny one. Uh, yep, right there. Oh, So fantastic. that is Look the 1853 map of Tampa. So again, if you any any land purchase that is done in the grid part, um, the, the legal description is based on this very map. Now, this map here is a part of your digitization process, right? Yes. So you actually have the real map. We right? have the original map, yeah. So if you zoom in to the Fort Brook portion, um, wow, you can see. If, I don't know how much more you can zoom in, but there, if you move your cursor a little to the left, right here. Yep, that is the Estuary Cemetery. So we, that's why we know it's not the cemetery associated with the fort. Um, and this map is from what year? 1853. Wow. And so, and again, it's wow. the, and actually that shows the, the um, burial mound that is about where SPP's property is. Um, and then there's the cemetery right there, the estuary cemetery. There it is. Yeah. So you got with SPP and said, hey, check this out. Yeah. You and so clearly you, have, you, you know, underground yep, you graves. Get, yep. And, and so they engaged an archaeological firm, a cultural management firm, um, and they, there's a legal process you can go through um, in these instances to to uh, disinter the remains and, and and have them reinterred somewhere. And so they went through that process. That's a weird kind of thought and a hurdle to get over, right? Because on one hand, you know, if you weren't allowed to build on top of any sort of prehistoric land, well, you probably couldn't build anywhere. Well, that's you know. Europe deals with this in, in a right. really different way than, than, than we way. do. But Go yeah. to Rome and check yeah. that out. And so, but yeah, it's a place as old as Tampa. Um, you're going to to run into historical properties, and so if you if they can be uh, preserved. So here's a great example. Um, it, as as it, you know, I'm sure some would have liked to have seen that cemetery you know brought back and, and restored, but it's not particularly practical, um, and it had become uh, lost. 
um, just through time oh, and, yeah. and just kind of lack of understanding. Now, the the opposite version of that is Zion Cemetery, um, which is a part of the Robles Park apartments and was really intentionally uh, hidden, and mm. the property was redeveloped. That uh, will be and should be um, restored as a as a cemetery, and so now, those remains will will be there and and recognized as such. And that and that was a cemetery for African American residents in Tampa, unlike uh, this estuary cemetery. I think that's the one I was thinking. Earlier. Yeah, you think of Zion. Yeah, Zion, yeah. which is in kind of Tampa Heights area, exactly on Florida Avenue. Why would it be impractical impractical for SPP to create, regardless of of money? But why couldn't they bring back the cemetery? Well, they could have. They could have. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, but you... But what are we talking about? Has it been paved over 15 different times? It, yeah, and decades? actually, and then there had been a lot of intrusion through public work projects and things like that. And there's no the guarantee years. that you're going to find anything there, right? Without doing some sort of an, an you archaeological to do what's, dig. Yeah, you have to do what's called ground proofing. Can you look up... I think truthing. there was actually an article on this, Tyler. Just type maybe Water Street Graveyard would, would pull it up. But I, I remember I saw something like this in the newspaper. Yeah. So they actually, they didn't just build over it. They actually did a study. Hey, oh, what's, absolutely. what's here, oh, you know. Huge, huge study. Uncovers um, graves from the 1800s. Yeah. Look at no, this. They, so this a, is an article from 2018. A very diligent study. Water Street, Tampa uncovers graves from 1800s and more of cities past. Now, again, you knew the graveyard was here, but this is 100, what, 50 plus years ago. Yeah. And so, again, I, I knew it should have been there. I knew it was there. Again, until you do the ground truth and you don't know for sure because things, of course, happened between when that map was was created and, and, and today. Um, now, we certainly had a, a good sense that nothing had happened there because we know the history of development on that site. And right. they were all light industrial warehouses, um, no, you know, maybe footers poured, um, but, you know, kind of a concrete floor, no sub, nothing dug down into the ground. So mm-hmm. likely everything was still there other than um, the diagonal of Brewerian Street um, which they've took, they've taken that away as part of the redevelopment of the property, and then um, water pipes and things like that 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 intruded into the cemetery. How close does the history center work with a company developer like SBP when something like this occurs? Well, so um, we we're it depends on the on the company, you know. So mm-hmm. they engage they have engaged us from the very beginning. So they were very receptive to trying to figure out yeah. exactly what was going on. Exactly. Again, they they have talked to us um, since really day one about the history of the area. Um, and they really want that to inform what they do. Again, like you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of green spaces, but even like street names, they, there's some new streets that they've, that they've created or brought, brought back. And so they want to use uh, history to inform what they do. Um, even, you know, they have restaurants and things. They, they, they want to, to be able to include the history of the area as much mm. as they can. So they've been very, very engaged with us. So you're essentially sitting on the sideline while they do this study. Yeah, again, right. we're not, we don't have any archaeologists on staff, and so we, excuse me, we didn't do anything that related to the actual archaeological work, but we, we worked with the archaeologists and we can work with, with uh, SPP um, using the resources that we have to help inform them on what they're going to find. Wow, and so whatever they had to do to remediate, remove the graves, mm-hmm. you know, put them in a proper place. Exactly, and, and yeah, reinter build, the cemetery. Build that community. Exactly. Fascinating stuff. And <clears throat> so that was from... Do we know when that graveyard was first established? Because if the map was from the 1850s, it could have been even oh, early yeah. it was, 1800s. It was, yeah, it was probably you know beginning, um, well, no earlier than 1824 because the fort wasn't there. So sometime between 1824 and 1853. Wow. You know, the 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 most you know deaths that would have occurred would have been during the Second Seminole War, mm. either through you know disease, which has always been a kind of a killer in the 19th century warfare or actual warfare. And so likely it's, it's kind of uh, most prominent time would have been the 1830s and early 1840s. Wow. I was doing research on Fort Brooke for the uh, Instagram page. You know, I just, mm-hmm. I think that's actually maybe how we got connected initially was yeah. I was posting some history stuff yeah. and I would do a little research and Fort Brooke had, or the Fort Brooke parking garage had a similar problem. Yeah. That was also a cemetery. That was, and that was found purely by accident. Mm. And so that was in 1980 when they redeveloped what was called the quad block. And, um, and yeah, they literally, they're digging footers or whatever you're doing for, for large construction and they found human remains. So and no map spoke everything. of the cemetery. Not that they looked at. And mm. so, um, again, there was obviously the knowledge that Fort Brook existed, but you know, a lot of that is North of Whiting and Whiting street is the, was the kind of historic common boundary between Tampa 
on the north and Fort Brook on the south. Um, but the cemetery was on the other side of Whiting. Uh, and that's because that boundary wasn't created until the 1840s, the late 1840s. And so that cemetery likely or obviously existed prior to that. Um, and so there, it, it didn't, it does show up on a few maps, but it, no one thought to look basically mm-hmm. at that time. So they're literally digging footers. Yeah. They hit a bone or yeah. something and yeah. go, uh oh. Yeah. And to their credit, they didn't just say, uh oh, and then shove it out of the way. Right. They actually stopped construction. That was a city project, though. Correct. It was heavy city funding. The, yeah. the quad block was. Maybe a, that's the reason why. I don't uh, know. Prob- probably. Probably. Uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, that, that was a, you know, one of the big efforts to try and revitalize. You know, we started our conversation about downtown. Right. Right. It's it's um, kind of uh, it's decline, and so the quad block was one of the efforts, as, as well as creating the Franklin Street pedestrian mall to bring people back mm-hmm. into downtown, which obviously wasn't particularly successful at that time. No, you're talking eighties, you 80s, said, yeah, eighties, yeah, 80s. yeah. Downtown was a was a very really a dead zone up until only the last five six years. Yeah, you know, again with the the condo boom that happened in the early two thousands, mm-hmm. you know, you had Element and um, the one, but I always forget the name across the way, same builder, Sky Point. Yep, and then but you also had like the the, the Moss Brothers building. That whole block was torn down because that was going to be a condo, but that happened right at the beginning of the recession, so we still have a parking lot there. Yeah, I've were, been I've been thinking about, you know, I hope a similar situation doesn't happen to that first watch building on Tampa Street. Yeah. I, I'm fearful of that where a developer comes in, they want to build a new condo and yeah. bulldoze a historic structure. Yeah. Well, what happens if they bulldoze it and then the real estate market I know, you know, drops off the edge and how is the yeah, history the centered, surface lot? Right. And then we have a parking lot for the next decade and a half. Yeah. yeah. Is the History Center taking note of some of these structures? I know this is a little bit of a side from mm-hmm. the history of our area, but how closely is the History Center looking at looking at structures? Because there's been a lot of historical buildings that have been torn down. There have been, and, and so you know we you know we're not in a position to to you know, obviously acquire any buildings or or to try and save them. But so in the case of the Moss Brothers building, um, we knew the importance of Moss Brothers to to our history. So we were able to recover some archaeological features of that, particularly the the sign that was on the side of it. So I was actually in the building on the north side as they're taking that sign down, um, which is now in the stairwell of the History Center, um, as they're tearing down the south part of the building. And so every now and then the building would shudder as they're smashing into the side of it with a wrecking ball. And the company that we're using is, is taking the, the sign out of the front of the building. Um, and so we can we can save those architectural elements um, and and help kind of tell the story of the the early built environment. Um, but other than that, and, and documenting in photography and things like that, right? Um, that, that's about the only thing we can do at this point. And it's a shame because you're right. You know, something like uh, that was a hotel and was the the, um, the Tribune's building for a long time, the first watch building. Um, there you go. There's Moss Brothers. And what a gorgeous old brick um, building. Oh right, yeah, too. And so. Um, and even the buildings that are still downtown, the old ones that have stucco on them, which is something they did in the 40s and 50s, you know, you take that stucco off and a little bit of redevelopment. Yeah, there's uh, the Rignon company. Yeah, there's John himself. Or Joe. Scroll, scroll up, Tyler, to that first oh, picture. There's me. Oh, you were the author of that. This yeah, article I wrote here. that little. This, this is actually a great point, and you can you can actually see the Tampa Bay Hotel in the background. Yep, there. You can yeah, see that. Yeah. see the minarets. Um, so to to go from the Civil War era, only you, we're only talking twenty years later, mm-hmm. and Tampa has these. At the time, were tall, big buildings, department stores, businesses. That seems like a really high level of growth. Was there a yeah. boom period after the Civil War? Well, so yeah, so there was a, actually a pretty big drop after the war. Um, mm. And so the kind of the classic stat that everybody gives, in 1880, so you're looking at 15 years after the end of the Civil War, there were 720 people living in Tampa. And that basically <laughs> is downtown. Wow. In 1890, 10 years later, there are 5,500 people living in uh, the, the, the city of Tampa, which at that time was... Um, four wards, so it had grown geographically as well. You had downtown as the first ward, uh, Tampa Heights as the second ward, Hyde Park as the third ward, and Ybor City as the fourth ward. And so, and it's because of Ybor City, because of the cigar industry and the railroad uh, and the phosphate industry. People don't think about phosphate very much, but that was kind of the third leg of the stool that really helped enhance the port. Uh, that's what drove Tampa's growth. And so you, you kind of go even further between 1880 and say 1910. We grow from 720 in 1880 to um, about 
seventy thousand people oh by, by nineteen ten. Post cigar boom. Exactly. Right. Well, we're well into the exactly into the into the cigar industry. The port is finally open, so you're bringing a lot of business there. Um, the railroad, the city's growing, and then the teens and twenties. Other than World War One, you've got you know real suburbs that we know today. So Pomacea, Virginia Park, um, probably Seminole going Heights. At Seminole that time. Heights in the teens and twenties. Davis Island's created Beach Park, uh, new suburb, beautiful. Yeah, because um, Hyde Park. You know, the core of Hyde Park is suburb beautiful. Um, and so they created one that was new called the New Suburb Beautiful in the 20s. Uh, uh, Parkland, things like that. And then, of course, West Tampa. You think about, you know, we annexed West Tampa in 1925. That was a separate city. Uh, Port Tampa. Port Tampa City was a separate city. That was still the 1960s. Um, if you had all these areas that were outside of the city limits, um, if they all were part of Tampa as a census area, we would have been the largest city in Florida in the 1920s. We've always kind of tailed behind either Miami or Jacksonville or, you know, some combination of the two. Um, but we would have been the largest city. Um, and we certainly were the most important city on the West Coast and probably still are. Um, but Miami surpassed us during the, the 20s and then the 30s and, and then kind of really looked back. Right. And Jacksonville, they cheat because it's all Duval County. I know. We can't. Uh, They're like, yeah, our city's 800 square miles. <laughs> exactly. It's like, yeah, you know, we're the biggest so, city in the world. Yeah, and that, that it doesn't quite... Uh, it doesn't count. So book. there's this massive period of growth for quite a long time. It yeah, sounds like up until like well, the, the depression, very, the very late 1800s, mm -hmm. right? Flagler yep. comes. I'm sorry, plant. plant comes. Builds the Tampa Bay Hotel. You have more tourism, <clears throat> while almost at the same time, uh, Ebor, Ebor City cigars, yep. Ebor, West Tampa, Palmetto Beach, all that. So yeah, you got 1890s. And then you the have 1920s. this massive immigration too. Mm -hmm. That's when my family came. Yeah, late 1800s from yeah. Sicily. That's when a lot of other families Absolutely. came here. Yeah, you've got the yeah the, the Sicilians, uh, Spaniards, Cubans, Afro Cubans. Um, Tampa then, must have been something to see at that time. It would have the been the turn of the century. Very metropolitan. Um, you know, the most diverse city in the South. Uh, right. You know, people say New Orleans may have been as as or more diverse, but. If you look at the the different groups of people in, in, in New Orleans, you've got you got French, you got Cajun, uh, and you've got you know kind of traditional white and black. But in Tampa, again, we just like you said we have Sicilians, uh, Spaniards, uh, Cubans, Afro Cubans, uh, and then a lot of German immigrants coming in uh, to mix in with the kind of pre existing Southern population of white and black. Uh, you had a place where you know, Spanish would have been probably the, the common language right. for a brief time in the 1890s, uh, more so than in English. But then it flipped again, but we're very metropolitan. Lots of, you know, lots of things that were here, opera houses and things, and, yeah. and mutual aid societies, all that stuff. You didn't see that anywhere else in the South. No, very, really, really interesting too. I mean, if you were to compare a city from the Northeast at the time to Tampa, it might have looked very similar, right? Heavy levels of immigration from all different mm -hmm. parts of the world, a lot of different industries lining up, the culture and the arts and these opera houses. Mm -hmm. I mean, how unique that was extremely unique to the South. Very right? much at so. that time, yeah. the South was very one note. Yeah, it was either you know white or black, agrarian, uh, very few industries. Um, obviously, we're a smaller scale than right. you know, the, the northeastern cities, but um, from kind of a, a per capita standpoint, absolutely, we're as as diverse uh, as as any place you'd see. Could you pull up Tyler? I think it's called the Hotel Tampa Terrace. Tampa Terrace Hotel, that yeah. beautiful old mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. I do want to talk about some of the buildings in Tampa. When you look at old photos of downtown Tampa. It was really amazing. I mean, we've lost a lot of our historic buildings, but some of them were magnificent, like something you would almost see in New York City or something. Oh, yeah. So the, the Tampa Terrace was it was a really distinctive building. I mean, look at that. Um, Gorgeous. Go to that picture that shows the street level, Tyler. Where did it go? On the top, uh, Facebook. I mean, look at the architecture. Yeah. Really, really pretty. So this would have been, looks like Frank, no, not Franklin. It's Florida Avenue. Florida, Florida Avenue. Yeah, this is Florida Avenue. You can see the hotel floor, and then the floor the distance. up some distance, yeah. And so, yeah, downtown had hit some the really Instagram link, Tyler. Grand hotels, uh, the Hillsborough Hotel, the Florida, and the DeSoto, uh, um, Tampa Terrace. This is a little write up I did on it, but yeah, I mean, I you know coming across this building, I thought, why isn't that here anymore? Look at this gorgeous structure. And reading through the the curation of the marble from Italy and some mm. of the furniture, like this was a very, very luxurious hotel. Yeah. It's not here anymore because it was cheaper to tear it down than it would have been to renovate it. Yeah. And it was something that just wasn't done um, in the second half of the 20th century. You know, we really neglected our downtown 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, you know, you ask the question, you know, how has it been that we tore this down? But, you know, I can also turn it around how it's amazing that we didn't tear everything down. The Tampa Theater exists still today. The Tampa Bay Hotel is the University of Tampa. That still exists today, even City Hall. Right. You know, we have, you know, we have some some successes, um, but it's it's even a wonder that we have those because there was really not a um, significance that was placed on these buildings. Uh, they were they were merely you know financial assets that could be you know dealt with however they need to be dealt with, uh, and if it didn't work out financially, then then tear it down and it's a surface lot. Which I'm not paying as much property taxes on. I'm not maintaining. You mm-hmm. know, I don't have to be to retrofit with air conditioning, all those things that, um, and, and I'm not fighting with the suburbs and with other hotels. One of the biggest things going into the 70s and 80s that was a big detriment to downtown was the the West Shore Business District. You know, there was a time, mm. and it may still be this way, but I don't think it's this way anymore because of Water Street. Uh, there was actually more office space on West Shore than there was downtown. Oh, that was a very recent statistic. Yeah, yeah. yeah there was over a hundred thousand employees in West Shore, and and I'm I'm talking about something I read maybe six eight years yeah. ago. Yeah. Hundred thousand employees in West Shore, and then eighty ninety yeah. in in downtown yeah. Tampa. Yeah, and then you got lots of hotels there. They're all new. They're all air conditioned, mm-hmm. and so and so really more to come too. There's a lot of mm-hmm. development moving into West Shore. I mean, we're having development all across the city, but um, I think people today want to live in an urban environment mm. as, as a general oh, yeah. sense, my generation and younger. Yeah. And that was not the case um, oh, when no. people my age in, in maybe the 1960s and 70s, everyone wanted that suburban, oh, absolutely. You know, car-centric lifestyle. Carol Wood. Right. Carol, you know, that's all, all that. that era. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I, you know, part of it is the, I guess, American culture is the reason oh, why yeah. our downtown kind of had a demise for quite a while. The automobile. And, Automobile. Yeah. 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 Roads. That cars, also ties into the like highway that. system, which Absolutely. we spoke about. Yeah. I know you got to run soon. Yeah, um, right. And maybe we'll do a part two on, on yeah. let's say, after the Great Depression until yeah. uh, now, which would be good. But let's wrap up and talk about the actual History Center. Um, maybe plans for the future. You guys have a beautiful building, like we said, kind of in the Water Street downtown area. Are there plans to expand different exhibits that are coming up that people should know about? So we can't physically expand the building anymore. We actually did do that in 2018. Uh, We had a roof space that hadn't been built out when we built the building. So we built that out and added uh, a large permanent gallery called Treasure Seekers. And we also added the Cartographic Center. Mm. Um, And so for now, what we do, uh, we have this, this concept we call the History Hub. And so our expansion now is... Um, partnering with other organizations or even, you know, municipalities to operate uh, historic properties. And so we're doing that in Hernando County uh, with a place mm-hmm. called Chinsegat. And so it was just outside of Brooksville. It's an antebellum uh, home that has an incredible history of both you kind know, of prior to the Civil War, but also going into the early 20th century. Um, you know, we're now partnering with the Housing Authority on St. James Church, uh, which is part of the Encore development, but it's an historic property within the larger Encore area. And so we're doing programming there and we're uh, looking into seeing logistically, you know, what it would take to turn that into a museum. Mm. Um, and so we've got other partnerships that were kind of in the in the hopper as well. So that's how we're expanding. Um, that's just the physical space you can't do that. But we're also, kind of as you alluded to, uh, it's been 15 years. And so we have what we call permanent galleries, but nothing's permanent. And so we just, uh, last year, changed out part of the permanent gallery on the third floor, added a place called Treasure Seekers. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's some great shots of the interior. Um, again, in 2018, we added to the fourth floor, so that was expansion. But now we're we're assessing our permanent galleries uh, over the next few years to make sure that all the stories we're telling are the ones that people, uh, you know, want, want to, are still engaged with. And, and did we, have we learned anything? That's a really old picture of the, of the uh, atrium. That's really old. Um, the, the Treasure Seekers is really cool. Yeah, we actually, right we didn't even touch on that. Uh, during the show today, we'll have to have you back on. But I mean, the maritime history of Tampa. Oh yeah, too, that's a huge. whole that's a whole show in and of itself. Because we're still the biggest port in Florida, I believe, in terms of tonnage. Well, and that's the thing: phosphate's heavy. Fos- and so, <laughs> okay, so that's where we're, we're a cheating lot a of the stuff. We're then, cheating yeah. a little bit, and so you know, uh, one of the things that that is a difficulty with our port and our growth, unfortunately, is the the, um, the Skyway Bridge. Mm. It it restricts the height, of course, and even the width of container traffic mm-hmm. and large the, the largest of cruise ships which so, is crazy because you look at the bridge and go yeah oh, any ship could yeah fit how that. does something not go under there right um, but no there are container ships 
that um, I that definitely don't fit. And I believe that's the reason why we can't have certain cruise ships come to us, come to us. Too. Yes, the, there are the, so the biggest cruise ships won't fit there either. And so, believe it or not, you know the the horizon is 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 coming in on um, having to reevaluate the Skyway. It was uh, re, the the new Skyway, as it were. Right. The, the Bob Graham Skyway Bridge was built in 1987. And so they have a practical life and we're actually not at the end of its practical life, but there will be a time in our lifetime when that bridge will have to probably either be greatly restructured because of just the, the lifespan of bridges or maybe replaced. And then the discussion can be, well, what do we do with our port and with that bridge? Mm. Do you make it, you know, another 50 feet taller and another, you know, the, the, the entrance in the shipping channel, 50 feet wider. Is that enough? Right. Um, there was a time when they were rebuilding or contemplating the rebuilding of the bridge um, of making a tunnel go under instead of having a bridge go over. And obviously logistically that's difficult. It's possible. Sounds expensive. It's expensive. And you can't have any um, hazardous waste or any kind of hazardous materials go through there. So all the trucking traffic would have to be rerouted. And that would be a difficulty. Yeah. All this horrible news with the Baltimore bridge collapse. Go go to the picture on the left. It, a lot it, of people don't know that the Skyway was actually hit. Yeah. In, I believe the 70s. 1980. 1980. May 1980. 30 people died or so. Horrible 35. tragedy. 35. And the, the biggest contributor to that, unfortunately, was a Greyhound bus. Uh, was one of the oh my one of the vehicles that went that went in. Um and so no, absolutely, you know, with with the disaster, and there's the some adventure, the the ship that, yeah. that hit the bridge. Um, and it, you know, interestingly, and this is, you know, one of those, uh, however these things happen, the way that the, um, Francis Scott key bridge was built, the entire span fell when, when that ship hit it, you can see here, there's a portion of the bridge that was damaged, but that didn't go. And you can see the, the car, this guy named Hornbuckle, his car, was able to stop just in time, um, looking at the Baltimore disaster, that part of the bridge came down as well. Right. Um, so, but the, the difference also, I guess they had this May Day call that stopped traffic on the bridge. Mm-hmm. So that presented also the time of day. This happened at, uh, uh, in the, in the morning, uh, but a blinding rainstorm, um, versus that being a, a, a um, some sort of equipment mechanical, problem, mechanical right. or electrical problem. Yeah. Um, but also in the middle of the night when traffic was much lighter. Which was, I, it it actually looks similar to the key bridge in yeah, Baltimore. It's, it's Probably a, same um, era, 1970s. So, so, yeah. So I forget which span was hit. So the original Skyway was built in 54. And then in the, in the 60s, the second span was built so they could actually accommodate interstate traffic. The key bridge was built in 77, I think. So, but the same era. Uh, similar style bridge, the, the, the steel structure. Scary stuff. It is. It really is. Um, I remember distinctly, I was a young kid when this happened, but I remember walking to my mom's uh, room and she always watched the Today Show and then the so Channel 8, whatever, local news cut in. And I remember seeing that and, and her, you know, thinking, oh, wow, that's obviously a terrible disaster that's happened. And it's it's one of those things you just can't imagine. Like driving over the bridge, I don't know, you don't think yeah. that the entire yeah. road could fall out from under you. I know, well, you try not to. You try sure. not to as you're driving over, right? Yeah, a lot of people get I try nervous not to. driving over Oh, no, I know a lot of people who won't go over that bridge. Me too, yeah. yeah. But it's it's kind of fun to go over the bridge too. It's, it's so high up. Hey, I know you got to roll a couple minutes here. Let's wrap up. Um, Tampa Bay History Center dot org is the website. That's the website. The Instagram, I believe, is Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay History. History. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and you guys are pretty active, always posting cool stuff. So make sure to give them a follow. Yeah, we we try to to make it interesting, and you know, either whether it's you know some uh, behind the scenes, you know, artifact shots or maps, mm-hmm. uh, photos. Um, so we we try and stay active. We also have a blog, um, which you showed what the Moss Brothers bit. Um, from the blog and so we try and add to that and you can uh, get well. there on the website there's a link at the top that yeah. says blog click that and there's so much more we could dig into i have to have you back on i'd love to so thank you so much for doing the show today i appreciate uh, it my pleasure thanks absolutely Ronnie. all right that's it bye everybody thank you guys for watching this episode if you enjoyed it make sure to like it check us out on youtube subscribe to our channel give us a comment give us some feedback we want to know how we're doing thanks for watching bye everybody <laughs>